Well, thank you, Helen, for these kind words. And uh, thank you for coming to this strange topic. Uh, I just posted on Facebook uh, that I arrived at Newbold, so some people would know, uh, for this lecture this evening. And, uh, well, probably you would have to be insane to come to this lecture. Anyway, uh, diversity. Diversity has many facets, male, female, um, varying ethnicities, cultures, nationalities, diverse faith traditions, lifestyles, sexual orientations, etc. Tonight I would like to add to, the, to this list of diversities an aspect perhaps less often talked about, the mental status. When the title of this presentation combines mental illness and spiritual health, it probably strikes us as odd. Other than spiritual health, which we might consider a matter of practice, of perseverance, of grace, maybe. Mental illness is just one of those things in life, a given, but something not of much worth for theoretical, let alone theological or spiritual reflection. Mental illness is something we strive to overcome, not to ponder. See, I view myself as a mental health professional. And uh, this lecture series is about uh, diversity, not deviance, or is it? In order to give you a glimpse where I'm coming from, um, Allow me to first of all tell you a story. It is part of my story, part of my own journey or simply a case study of mental instability. I was 18, getting ready to start my studies here at uh, Newbold College. And between secondary school and college I tried to earn some money. Even in those days, New World did cost money. And I applied for a summer job at Bethel, near Bielefeld, Bethel, the <coughs> city of mercy. Let me tell you a little bit about it. The von Bodelschwing Foundation Bethel started as a home for persons with epilepsy, founded in 1867 by the Home Mission in Bielefeld, its objective was to provide a home for persons with seizure afflictions, as it was called then, at a time when persons with mental or physical weaknesses were still being pushed to the edge of society. Under the management of Friedrich von Bodelschwing and his successors, Bethel developed into Europe's largest Christian social welfare service entity. My summer's work brought me to what would have been called an insane asylum 100 years earlier. A hospital for, or home you might call it, for severely mentally disabled men, most of them quite old, at least in the eyes of an 18-year-old boy from Berlin. The father of the house, the male equivalent of a matron, I guess, welcomed me to my job with a question whether I knew what incontinence was. Because my major task would be to deal with that. I didn't. <laughs> he smiled and suddenly I did. Most of these elderly men lived in homes for the mentally disabled for all their lives. Pitiful creatures, I thought. But strangely enough, 
happy and content. In fact, I would venture to say, never again in my life have I seen that many truly happy people in one place. Every Sunday, as their highlight of the week, they were able to leave the locked up confines of their home. They were dressed in some polyester suit and uh, had some starched shirts put on and then they were marched to church. After church, they got a special treat. Mr. K, for instance. Mr. K usually got a raw onion, which he loved to eat like an apple, with unbelievable delight, and occasionally he also got a cigar. This is the backdrop to my story. Mr. K, this elderly gentleman from the mental hospital, had the habit of falling asleep in church. Usually, when the prelude was starting, he dozed off, and when the postlude had finished, he became awake again. I knew he was sleeping all the way through. He snored and sometimes even lost control of some bodily functions the house father had warned me about. I was 18 at the time, so I couldn't resist interviewing Mr. K after church. Mr. K, I would ask, did you enjoy church today? Yes, he did, and he beamed with a happy smile that I will never forget. Hmm, I continued, and, uh, and uh, did the pastor preach a good sermon today? I knew full well that the men had been sleeping <coughs> all the way through the church service. Yes, he did. And he was grinning kind of from ear to ear with true and honest excitement. And what did he preach about? Pause. The smile froze to a frown. Mr. K looked at me in utter disbelief, as if to say, how can you ask such a stupid question? What did he preach about? Well, he preached about the kingdom of God, he did. And then he was back to his smile. And now it was on me to lose my mischievous grin and uh, had to learn a lesson that has stuck with me all my life since. This man of great <coughs> mental instability had understood something about grace and the kingdom of God that didn't even require him to be awake in church. I never again asked Mr. K a teasing question. I'm using this uh, anecdote to illustrate from my own life um, a point that I wish to make about mental illness and spiritual health. In fact, I'm not sure whether this story is about Mr. K or about myself. What actually is spiritual health, mental health, physical health? How do we measure it? What are our assumptions about these? Spiritus mens corpus are the words on the seal of one of the universities I once graduated from. Sort of echoing the old Latin saying, mens sana in corpore sano, with the spirit, uh, spiritus added, of course, because it was a Christian university. A healthy mind in a healthy body will equal a healthy spirit. Or more specifically, and back to my topic, is mental capacity 
a prerequisite for physical, for healthy spirituality. In fact, even if I leave off the spirituality aspect for a moment and simply focus on the Latin saying for a moment, do you believe it to be true? Be careful now, it might be a trick question. The Nazis in Germany, following Heinrich von Treitschke's lead, who glorified Prussian virtue and militarism, certainly believed in this saying. Physical exercise, Leibesübungen, were seen as a prerequisite to have a sound mind that could properly fathom Nazi ideology. Now, here you might perhaps argue that this is a very holistic view. But the reverse conclusion meant for the Nazis, if the mind was not healthy, the bodily existence became worthless, became inferior. And ultimately it was more gracious to end such a life. Thus the Nazis developed a program that was called Euthanasia program, mercy killing, killing thousands of mentally disabled people. <coughs> In fact, Bethel was one of the very few places where the euthanasia program was actively and successfully resisted. The majority of mental institutions in Germany were quick to follow the rationale of the Nazis. Let's try the whole thing the other way around. One of the most meaningful, deep, sharp-minded conversations in my life I experienced as a hospital chaplain when I did my rounds on the wards, visiting people with broken bodies, riddled with cancer or with heart disease, dying painful deaths. No corpus sana, but most definitely mens sana. Now, of course, anecdotes don't prove anything, but perhaps they raise a question mark here and there in regards to our <coughs> concept of wholeness. Against such question marks, allow me to reflect with you possible connections between spirituality and mental health. I would like to test some hypotheses with you, and you're certainly invited to question or disagree uh, with my conclusions. The purpose of this exercise is not so much to convince you of my wonderful insights, but rather to be a catalyst for thinking some thoughts that may be new, that may be odd or uncomfortable. And in the end, I hope to some degree enlightening. In all these struggles, we're trying to find the interconnection, if there is any, between spiritual health and mental illness. Hypothesis one, let's start with the first one. Mental health, mental capacity is a prerequisite to spiritual health. Now, can a person with Down syndrome, trisomy 21, be a Christian, for example? You know, in the Adventist tradition, we baptize people on their confession of faith. Can we baptize a person with this illness or other mental disabilities? Well, yes, if the person isn't too much incapacitated. 
<coughs> Actually, I'm hesitant because it might be easy to manipulate a mentally disabled person into consent to baptism. Just this last weekend I was on a convention on spiritual abuse and it's easy to get into spiritual abuse. Uh, though I sometimes wonder whether we don't do the same thing, and this is geared towards us as Adventists here, we don't do the same thing with healthy children while we actually claim to practice adult baptism. In philosophical terms, we might put it like this. Are mentally ill people able to come to free will decisions to give consent to a set of beliefs which they are obviously not able to intellectually grasp. In a real world of Seventh-day Adventists, for instance, church membership and baptism are linked and thus you obviously have an ethical dilemma. You do have a problem here. Now, if we ignored it and simply baptized and accepted people into our church despite their limited mental abilities, we would be in danger of being misleading at best. Callous, more likely. Fraudulent, even if well-intentioned. If, on the other hand, we follow this line of reasoning and are hesitant about evangelizing mentally disabled or incapacitated people into the church, we would have to concur with hypothesis one. We would be saying mental health is a prerequisite to spiritual health. And if I wanted to be facetious, I might say the more complex the theology, you know, like Adventist apocalyptics, the more you need mental capacity. Let's leave uh, those with mental problems to other churches with a more simple belief system. Well, I do hope you get my sense of irony, which sometimes is weird and very German. Uh, I, I do not believe other churches are theologically lower developed. In fact, sometimes I wonder about my own church and her way of doing theology. And more importantly, I do not believe that theology and spirituality ought to be equated. It is a particular Adventist fallacy to often equate the two, theology and spirituality, that is. To believe, say, in the in the Sabbath or in the Second Coming, the sanctuary, you name it, is often viewed as spirituality. It is not. It is not even theology, or to be exact, just one small aspect of theology, i.e. doctrine. Spirituality it is not. And thus, perhaps we do have some kind of a backdoor for our ethical dilemma. Hypothesis 2. Spirituality is a prerequisite to mental health. There are so many crazy things going on in the secular world, so much insanity that indeed we can wonder whether this isn't connected to society's loss of faith. There appears to be a correlation between the increase of mental problems in our society and the loss of faith. If you lose your faith, if you don't have some kind of spirituality, you lose your grip on life. A uh, popular, almost common sense view, especially among those who need the crutch of faith, as critics would claim. 
But before I'm becoming cynical, let me make clear there are some good points to such a hypothesis. My main area of expertise uh, is marriage counseling. Whether we, we believe it or not, all areas of married life, from communication via financial management, leisure activity, conflict resolution, right down to plain sexual satisfaction, all areas are positively correlated with spirituality. Or as one of my professor once summarized a study by Andrew Greeley, a famous American sociologist, if you want to have a good sex life, pray a lot. In another longitudinal study on um, longevity factors, Roland Grossart Maticek was encouraged by his pious grandmother to also test for healthy spirituality as one factor because he wanted to be polite, he wanted to be obedient to his grandma, he did. And lo and behold, it became the largest, single most important predictor of longevity by itself. But more importantly, no factor like abstinence, good nutrition, sufficient sleep, not even good genes, had a lot of impact on longevity. <coughs> However, when these factors were coupled with a healthy spirituality, they suddenly soared to unexpected heights. Except uh, for genetics, by the way. Is it too much, then, to assume that good, healthy spirituality is also a prerequisite to mental health? Hypothesis three. Spirituality and mental illness are synonymous. There's no such thing as spiritual health except not to have any. All of us have experienced some kind of religious lunatics. What we can observe among the Taliban, and sometimes much closer to home, can endear us to Freud's position, once again, that religiosity in and of itself is mental illness, and definitely something to overcome. I mean, imagine you came from outer space to observe the human race. You've just read a human book on psychopathology when you enter into a room and see somebody talking, say in a language you don't know, but there's nobody there he or she talks to. There's no mobile phone and no other technical devices. And uh, perhaps instead a candle is burning even though there is perfect electrical light fitted in the room. I mean, wouldn't that strike you as odd? How do you know that people who tell you they have personally met Vishnu, or Jesus for that matter, are not a little bit psychotic. And I will consider a genuine borderline patient a little later. In other words, any phenomenon observable around spirituality has a genuine capacity to be defined as mental illness. Well, I, I guess I couldn't keep my job in the theology department of this college if this indeed would be my position, but I have to admit that it is not a hypothesis that I might call absurd right from the outset. It's not absurd. It does make a lot of sense as do the other rather conflicting hypotheses before that, depending on how you look at them. So I'll come to hypothesis number four. 
there is no connection between mental illness and spiritual health. What researchers call the null hypothesis may be the most convenient in case of conflicting evidence. Perhaps we might agree that some forms of religiosity or spirituality can drive people mentally insane. We wouldn't call that healthy spirituality. But who are we to define that? <coughs> Other people greatly improve their mental health status by practicing spirituality. Putting everything together, we might conclude there is no line, no correlation, there is no pattern. You can have mental illness with or without spirituality, and you can have spirituality and be mentally sound or mentally deranged. These are not interrelated. And empirically, this hypothesis probably is true, but perhaps, I mean, just perhaps, it would be a bit disappointing for you if I left you with that. There simply is no influence of the Gulf Stream on the butter prices in Switzerland. <coughs> so what? Why did you come? this evening. Just to hear, there's no connection between the two. I simply put together two terms, spiritual health, mental illness, with a conjunction and, but they're not connected. Don't leave yet, if you bear with me, because if this last hypothesis is correct, the implications may be far greater than you might like. Because hypotheses one and two come from a perspective that defines someone with a mental illness as a specimen of the human race with a deficit. The cognitive abilities of a human are central. If they are <coughs> impaired, the humanity of that person is in question. Now, spirituality is something very human. <coughs> if humanness is lowered by some serious deficit, we would be hesitant, or we should be hesitant, to even talk about spirituality. You know, we probably would talk of the devotion of a dog, but not of the spirituality of a dog. And with this kind of language, you will have guessed we are back immediately in Nazi times. Sorting life according to some well-defined criteria as worthy or unworthy. The kinder variant, you know, they, they are human nevertheless, despite, and we allow them to live, is not much better really. The other way around, if there's no difference, there is far less danger of discrimination. In fact, there's more opportunity for diversity. And we may be closer to a paradigm that actually is in accordance with a Christian anthropology. See, the advantage of theology is the transcendence it can assume, if only as a working model. Moore, for instance, puts it like this, what is the human being through and in his or her relationship to God? In other words, definitions do not come from within what a person has or is in and of himself or herself. 
A theological anthropology, certainly a Christian one, will define the human being in relational terms. Biblically speaking, this would include being made in the likeness of God and being made with a special dignity. Not because of some intrinsic value. Just imagine the book of Genesis speaking of dust, earth, mud, for the rain-tested English people that man is created of. Not because of some inner strength, the very vocabulary of God breathing his breath through the nostrils to make him a living soul, a nefesh, which can be translated as throat, speaks of the vulnerability of the human being. Now, if we have this kind of anthropology, utterly weak, utterly worthless, dust, but enlivened, quickened by the breath, the Spirit of God, only in relationship with Him, we will take a different perspective on spirituality in relationship to cognitions. Let's go on to a little detour to the field of theology before we come to some practical implications and conclusions. I'm indebted to a recent graduate of the Humboldt University in Berlin who wrote an extended essay for a BA in Educational Rehabilitation entitled, and this is my translation, Handicapped Human dash Handicapped Faith? Question mark. The Development of Religious Faith in People with Mental Handicaps. Teresa Helmund is her name. Her paper was more of a master's dissertation, really, uh, if for no other reason. She mentioned and discussed Friedrich Schleiermacher, one of those wonderful philosophical theologians of the late 18th century, early 19th century, nobody really understands. But she was able to bring Schleiermacher across in a way even I was able to understand and appreciate. For Schleiermacher, she writes, doctrines and criteria of contents of religion are only of marginal interest. Will and reason are secondary. While religion certainly is not simply diffuse emotion, but the feeling of dependence on the transcendent. Still, emotion governs religiosity. And this can include a whole range of emotions. Different from metaphysics, religion does not seek to explain the world, the universe, the transcendent, but to behold and to experience it, to feel it. That's Schleiermacher. I think this sounds a little bit romantic, you are right, we speak of romanticism in connection with Schleiermacher and he was ridiculed by a lot of his contemporaries and way beyond. Yet I think he rightly emphasized that faith is far more than intellectual understanding, cognition, and that was quite a challenging paradigm in the time of the Enlightenment and has direct implications for our topic. When we say spirituality or religiosity, I think for this purpose I don't need to differentiate between the two all that much, is not primarily an exercise of our co cognitive abilities, then mental health and stability, uh, then Cognitive ability is neither a prerequisite to nor a measure for spirituality. There simply is no correlation, no connection. And it is exactly this absence of a connection that allows us to take seriously 
The spirituality of even those who suffer from mental illness or diminished mental capacity. They are loved by God and gain immediate value and dignity from that relationship. I.e. they don't have to fulfill a minimum standard to be of worth. And while there may be mental limitations, the emotional sensitivity may not be impaired at all, but rather be of an immediacy that could teach us a few things. Thus, my introductory story of Mr. K, he preached about the kingdom of God, he did, is not just a clever quip of by a mentally disabled person, but a spiritual lesson and challenge. He had a grasp of what happened in the worship service, which I quite frankly didn't have. If you would have asked me after that <coughs> church service, what did he preach about, I might not have been able to summarize the sermon so eloquently. Let me give you another case study which hopefully will lead us to another glimpse of why this might be relevant for our Christian life and for theologizing. Kathy, uh, pseudonym, was 22, a severe borderline patient. She had been hospitalized a number of times and was well known by the local psychiatrist who sent her to me because she did not want, the psychiatrist did not want to deal with the religious ideations that uh, were to be found in her psychotic episodes. You see, this is the problem. Once you are diagnosed with a mental illness, any religious experience is bound to, to be explained in terms of that illness. Thus, I was quite sure that when Kathy started to tell me of how Jesus had been visiting her, how he talked to her, giving me details of the most endearing nature, and most regressive, I might add, anybody listening to her from the mental health profession could have called these experiences psychotic episodes with religious content. It is not unusual at all that the content of a psychosis is determined by your upbringing. Kathy was brought up in a Christian home, thus her psychotic episodes were about Jesus. You see, I uh, now live in former communist East Germany. If a staunch atheist becomes psychotic, he might tell you the secret police had imprisoned him, and during that time they implanted a little radio transmitter right in the back of the head and uh, in, into the brain. They, they did it with such ingenuity that you couldn't even detect the scar on the skull. I tell you, in all seriousness and conviction. And uh, this radio transmitter now tells them what to do and uh, gives them all kinds of commands. Now, People who were brought up, on the other hand, on, say, science fiction novels and movies will tell you they have been abducted in a spaceship with the same kind of effect. And people who go to church regularly and become psychotic, you guessed it, will talk about angels and demons who take possession of their life. In other words, Kathy's psychotic episode had a religious flavor because this is how she was socialized. But hold on a minute. Who says? When I was sitting with her, listening to her beautiful renditions of her conversations with Jesus, I wondered whether these weren't genuine religious experiences with, yes, a psychotic flavor, i.e. exactly the other way around. I turned the paradigm around and suddenly it made sense. Those 
moments with Jesus were stabilizing her tormented mind. They were with all the regression, all the psychotic stuff involved, healing moments for her. I talked about this uh, case with a psychotherapist, a good friend of mine. He argued, oh, okay, so you are saying whenever some irrational contents appears to, appears to be helpful to a person, you will call it spiritual. Whenever it's destructive, you'll call it psychotic. Mm, well, of course not. But I wouldn't want to exclude that option either. In this particular case, there was a clear mental illness, but also some striking spiritual health. And why not? Who am I to decide how and to whom God reveals himself? What kind of arrogance is mine if I believe mental illness precludes spirituality? My friend offered an interesting way out uh, for me by suggesting there is a difference between reality plus religious experience on the one hand and religious experience as a constant, a constant reality in and of itself with resulting dysfunctionality. But yes, he did understand what I was trying to suggest. And this type of reasoning that I'm presenting here even allows for some criticism of uh, James Fowler, who in the tradition of Piaget, uh, Erickson and Kohlberg described seven phases of uh, development of faith. See the stepwise progression, the stepwise progression of faith from one phase to the next implies a certain hierarchy. Again, closely linked to cognitive capacities. No. Faith, spirituality goes beyond that. Fowler might describe the development of a person's theology, but not spirituality or faith in an experiential, existential sense. Why is this important? Why would I want to take serious the spirituality of people with mental illness? Am I romanticizing spiritual health? I hope not. The hypothesis that you need mental illness to obtain spiritual health is in my view as ludicrous and dangerous as the hypothesis that spiritual health is in any way dependent on mental health. There is no connection. And if there is no connection, or because there is no connection, I have the freedom to closely look at the spirituality of people with mental illness and be genuinely surprised and enriched or humbled. So what, you might say again. In my experience, the inclusion of this kind of diversity into our theological paradigms of viewing this world is likely to change our attitude towards the concept of human nature, will change, in fact, our perception and our action. I started my presentation with the story from Bethel, let me give you two historic glimpses of what it might mean if we started thinking that inclusive, if we allow this kind of diversity. Professor Brandt, the organizer of the euthanasia program in Nazi Germany, stated in Nuremberg, war crime in the war crime tribunal, Pastor von Bodelschwing was the only person whom I am aware of who had given a serious warning. Bodelschwing, with his intervention, risked his own life, but saved a lot of those people under his care and earned the greatest respect by the very one who instigated the killing. 
But more than that happened. At the trial of Brandt, Bethel's management submitted a petition to pardon Brandt. Now, they were not successful. I guess they were not even understood. Brandt was sentenced to death and executed. Now, about 50 years later, the Berlin Wall had come down and communist East Germany had deteriorated into a heap of rubble. The most powerful man of communist East Germany, Erich Honecker, who had persecuted Christians as his political enemies all his life, had become an old and well-hated and well-ridiculed and very sick man, physically as well as mentally. He was becoming more and more demented. He tried to flee from Germany but was extradited. He was too sick to be imprisoned. Where could he go? And in my view, one of the most uh, moving stories in recent German history, Erich Honecker received shelter and full hospitality in the private home of Pastor Uwe Holmer, the director of the East German outpost of the von, Bo uh, von Bodelschwing Foundation. The night Holmer granted Honecker asylum, he was severely criticized immediately. Demonstrations were organized against Holmer, but he stuck with his decision. True to his wide-ranging Christian anthropology, which demanded not only to forgive Honecker, who had made his own life miserable for decades, but to act as if it was most natural to give hospitality to this old senile man. For three months, the Honeckers lived in this Bethel, in this house of God, before he uh, immigrated uh, to Chile, where he died shortly after. Faith is not the tension between assuming and knowing, but a relationship. With this premise, mental illness and spiritual health are not excluding each other. We do well to extend our understanding of diversity. It will change our outlook on life. For me, this includes taking seriously human beings with mental illnesses, including their spirituality, not just out of compassion or rather condescension, but of a genuine interest at a level of equality, as this may inform and encourage my own faith, my own spiritual journey. As a little twist to my presentation, allow me to close with another very personal story which may illustrate my own strong feelings around these issues. You see, I haven't even bothered to define mental illness, illness or spiritual health, and I won't do it now. Yet you will see the blurred, ambivalent lines between mental illness and spiritual health in this story, I hope. While I was in Chicago, uh, in clinical pastoral education under the able supervision of a powerful Zulu woman uh, with Jungian training, I once had a dream. You know, this happens when you work with Jungian therapists, you start to dream. <laughs> I was traveling in a train from Bethel to Göttingen. Now, you already appreciate somewhat what Bethel is standing for. Göttingen, a city I actually have never visited in real life, was associated with a publishing house publishing wonderful books on pastoral care and pastoral counseling. This is the only connection between me and Göttingen. My task in the dream was 
to accompany some patients from Bethel on their journey to Göttingen. Thus, uh, with my patients, I boarded the train and the train started to move towards Göttingen. Vehicles that are moving sometimes occur in dreams of mine. They usually signal some kind of development in my own journey. Okay, here, here we sat on the train from Bethel to Göttingen. One patient left, one patient right. The conductor came and asked for our tickets. My patients produced their tickets, while I suddenly pulled out my very own disability pass, which allowed me to travel for free on public transport. And with healing horror, it suddenly dawned on me not I was accompanying them, but they were accompanying me on my journey to health, whether you want to call it mental or spiritual. I don't care. I was the handicapped, disabled person. Who am I then? to judge spiritual health or mental illness. Thank you. <laughs>